How wonderfully blessed we are to have uh, men like Blake uh, to lead us in our songs. We certainly do appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate ones like George who uh, swing by the building to uh, uh, lead in prayer and to help out behind the scenes as they can. And we appreciate you. We appreciate you for being with us uh, virtually this morning. And uh, we hope that you will uh, follow along as we study God's Word today. You know, we have learned uh, some, some valuable lessons being uh, in quarantine, being home uh, with our children, for those of us who have school-aged children. I hope that we have realized that teachers are grossly underpaid. I hope that if you didn't know that before, you know it now. Uh, many of us are getting a taste of, uh, of teaching our children, teaching ages that we weren't used to, and uh, it certainly is reminding us just how challenging of a job that is on a regular basis, but also rewarding, and we appreciate uh, the time that we get to spend with our families. It is the case that as Ezra and Nehemiah open and as the stories included there unfold, the nation of Israel is returning to the promised land, to the land that, that they had been taken from, from the captivity that they had been uh, a part of as punishment by God. Now they are returning to the land of promise. Tonight, Lord willing, we're going to continue our every Bible book in a word study, and we're going to study the book of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, as we're going to talk about tonight, God warns the nation of Israel through Moses that if they do not obey, they will go into captivity. But then He also says, if you repent, <clears throat> if you turn to Me, I'll allow you to come back to the land. Well, we see that play out exactly like that. And so now here they are returning to the land. And by the time Ezra chapter 3 is penned, Zerubbabel has overseen the rebuilding of the altar. By the time we get into Ezra chapter 6, the entire temple has been rebuilt. And by Nehemiah chapter 8, they are rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So as they've developed then the infrastructure once again for Jerusalem, for the, the temple, and for all of those physical structures, what is the next step? Well, what they have to do after that is they have to build the foundation, but not the physical foundation because in large part that's already been done. Now they have to try to rebuild the social and spiritual foundation of the nation of Israel. Everything had been placed on hold while they were in captivity in terms of, of temple worship, in terms of the, much of the legislation that God had imparted to them in the law of Moses. And now they wanted to bring it back. And there are a few things in particular that they wanted to institute as they began. I thought this would be a fitting lesson considering the circumstances we're in today. Essentially, worship as we desire to undertake it and as it is best undertaken is on hold right now. Now, we're still able to get together digitally. We're still able to sing together in some fashion, to uh, commune together to partake the Lord's Supper in some fashion, uh, to study and, and pray and teach and learn together, but not in the same way and, and not certainly in the best way. And so what I want to do is I want to, to move our eyes forward to when we finally get to come back. And I want to talk about the nation of Israel coming back and trying to rebuild that spiritual and social foundation. Well, what things did they rebuild specifically? What specific things did they do? I, I want you to go to the book of Ezra, if you don't mind, this morning. Ezra chapter 3. And, and what you'll find there is <clears throat> that in the book of Ezra, they are... Uh, rebuilding and reestablishing many of the ideas and many of the practices that they had before all of this started. Pick up in Ezra chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, When the seventh month was come, 
And the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then took up Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren. And they built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon its basis, for fear was upon the, uh, uh, was upon the people because of the people of their countries, and they offered burnt offerings, notice this, thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings, morning and evening. I want you to notice that the very first thing that they established, that they reestablished, as they set to rebuild this spiritual and social foundation, is the morning and the evening sacrifice. You can hold your finger in the book of Ezra and you can go back to Exodus if you don't mind. In Exodus chapter 29, as we were going through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, there were a great many things that we just couldn't focus on and couldn't talk about because of how much information is there. And one of those was the morning and evening sacrifice. Look at verse 38 beginning of Exodus chapter 29. It says, now, that, now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. Verse 39 says, the one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, the other lamb thou shalt offer at evening. And with the one lamb a tenth deal uh, of flour mingled with the fourth part of a hen of beaten oil, the fourth part of a hen of wine for drink offering, and the other lamb you offer at evening shall do thereto according to the meat offering of the morning, according to the drink offering for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. In verse 42, he continues to say, This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, where I will meet you to speak there unto thee. And there will I meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. Notice he said, I demand that you continue this morning and evening sacrifice every single day. This is to become an integral part of the daily services of the tabernacle, later the temple. But they had not had the opportunities to conduct it as they had before. And so now they have that chance. I want you to notice what one commentator had to say about that circumstance. It says, The whole system rested upon the daily sacrifice which was never omitted, to which all other sacrifices were superadded. And then I want you to notice what he says next. Not even the triumph of the Passover or the affliction of the Day of Atonement affected the daily sacrifice. Everything revolved around the morning and the evening sacrifice. And so the nation of Israel said, its leaders said, as they tried to repopulate Jerusalem and the surrounding area, they said, we need to get back to the morning and the evening sacrifice. Well, what did that represent? The morning and evening sacrifice underscored, number one, man's complete dependence upon God. Notice they couldn't make it 12 hours without reminding themselves that they needed God's atonement. They needed a sacrifice. They needed blood. And God was reminding them, as we just sang so effectively a moment ago, we need Him every hour. And the morning and evening sacrifice underscored that and in, made it an ingrained part of the culture of the nation of Israel. But number two, it underscored God's desire to have fellowship with man. I'm going to meet you there in the door of the tabernacle. And in these morning and evening sacrifices, fellowship will be perpetuated between you, my people, and me, God. Do we really comprehend our complete and total dependence on God? It's my hope that in moments of extreme change like we've experienced over the last month or so, that we use these moments as opportunities 
to reflect on just how dependent we are on God. How little control we have over our world. There are so many variables in our lives that can forever change our lives. Things over which we have little to no control. And therefore we must be dependent upon the one who is in control. As we think about all of these events surrounding us, there is a God who is in charge. And I hope that we're reminded of that. Dear friends, we desperately need God in every aspect of our lives. In particular, we must have Him if we ever are to be saved. In Romans 5 verse 6, when we were without strength in due times, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were helpless And Ephesians 2 reminds us, hopeless, without hope, without God in the world. But we need God. And He provided a means for us to be saved. But we don't just need God in terms of salvation. Lamentation 3, 21 and following reminds us that it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We recognize that every new day is a gift from God. We need God to even experience a new day. He demanded those morning and evening sacrifices. Day by day recognition of Israel's complete and total dependence on God. Dear friends, we need Him every hour. And I hope we are reminded of that as the nation of Israel was through those morning and evening sacrifices that they reinstituted as they began to get back into the promised land. Number two, the feast of the Passover. If you go back to the book of Ezra and this time you look at Ezra chapter 6, you'll see the reinstitution, the beginning again to practice in its complete fashion, the Passover. You go to Ezra chapter 6 and pick up in verse 19. It says, The children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. And the children of Israel were come again out of captivity and all such as separated themselves from them from the filthiness of the heathen they ate. They kept the feast of the Passover. I hope you're somewhat familiar with the feast of the Passover. Again, uh, something that we didn't get to get into in, in great detail as we went through the book of Exodus. The Passover would mark the beginning of the year. Every house was to kill a spotless lamb on the 14th day. They were to take the blood of that lamb. They were to strike it on the doorposts. They were to eat it roasted with bitter herbs. And interestingly enough, they were to eat it fully clothed to represent that that quick exit that the nation of Israel would make after the Passover, after every firstborn in the in the, the land of Egypt was killed that did not have the blood on the doorposts. They were to eat unleavened bread for seven days after that, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were to do these things and all of them were for some very specific reasons. Number one, these were to underscore God's power. Is there any greater demonstration of God's power in the Old Testament uh, than the Passover and what happened in the land of Egypt? The great cry that came out as all of the firstborn in the nation of Egypt were, were destroyed... By the hand of God, God's power, and in particular, His power in mercy and His power in judgment. No passage any greater underscores at the same time God's mercy and God's power than we see here in Exodus chapter 12 and the Passover. I want you to read just a moment with me verses 29 and 30. 
Exodus 12, it says, And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captivity in the dungeon, all the firstborn of cattle. And he rose up at night, Pharaoh did, and all his servants, all the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a dead where there was, there was not a house where there was not one dead. And so, of course, what did he say? He said, get up and go. That's the judgment of God. But for every member of the nation of Israel, it's the mercy of God. At the same time, those who were saved, God's mercy. And at the same time, those who were affected by the destruction, God's judgment. Dear friends, do we fully comprehend the power and the judgment of God? Think about the power, the infinite power that rests in the hands of God. His power to save, His power for mercy, and at the same time, His power for judgment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, to you who are troubled, rest with us. There's no greater picture of the mercy and, and the blessings that God wants to pronounce upon His people than that verse, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. But then the same picture that is for one group, a picture of mercy and God's power and love, is also a picture of God's power in judgment, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints, and to be admired in all them that believe. The mercy and the love and the judgment that's exhibited by God in all of His power. The nation of Israel came and they resettled the land of promise, those who came from the captivity. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the walls. And then they instituted the morning and the evening sacrifices first. Then they celebrated as one unit the Passover. Complete dependence upon God, a recognition of His power, His might, His mercy, His judgment. And then, they engaged in the Feast of Tabernacles, number 3. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 14, they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the Feast of the Seventh Month. It's often called the Feast of Booths. It's the, it's the Feast of Tabernacles. That's, that's what it is. And what they were to do, as you read in Leviticus chapter 23, in Numbers chapter 29, Deuteronomy chapter 16, the first thing that they were to do is rejoice. You know, and doesn't it sound interesting that the Lord would have to command the nation of Israel to rejoice? When you celebrate this feast... I want you to rejoice. Notice what he says in verse 33. The Lord spake unto Moses of Leviticus chapter 23, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. Do no work. Seven days you offer an offering by fire unto the Lord. Eighth day, holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire. Do no servile work. Verse 37, these are the feasts of the Lord and you shall proclaim in a holy convocation. And look at verse 40. And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. I command you, God says, to rejoice. He says, I want you to take this moment. I want you to take this opportunity and reflect on how much joy the child of God should have. What a wonderful idea. They were, as the text states, to dwell in tents. Verse 42 of Leviticus 23, you shall dwell in booths seven days to commemorate the wilderness wanderings, as we'll talk about in just a moment. 
They were also to offer specific sacrifices. And I have uh, up on the screen for you a chart outlining all of the sacrifices. If I were teaching, I would say, now students, you don't have to write these down. <laughs> you can write these down if you want to. You can, you can copy down uh, those numbers. But, but I put these up here for one reason really and one reason only. To underscore this simple fact. 71 bulls, 15 rams, 105 lambs, and 8 goats. That's the number that was to be involved in the offerings for the Feast of Tabernacles. Think about that. God went all in in His expectations for the Feast of of tabernacles. Why? What was God trying to accomplish? Well, I think God was trying to bring attention to this feast and to the attitude that He wanted His people to have. I think it was underscoring, number one, the wilderness wanderings and just, just the lessons that they should have taken from it. Every time the nation of Israel recognized and and celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles. They, they dwelt in tents, and it should have brought their minds back to the wilderness wanderings. And in particular, it should have reminded them that at one time, their forefathers rebelled against God. And that rebellion caused an entire generation to perish in the wilderness. They should reflect on that. But number two, and maybe just as importantly... They should have reflected on the joy with which the Jews should approach life and worship. I want you to think about that in particular this morning. I've had people express concern to me, especially preachers and leaders in the church have uh, expressed to me and maybe to others as well, uh, that they're worried that when we get back to... Uh, uh, to our quote-unquote normal lives, that church attendance will suffer. That people will grow so accustomed to just watching services online that, that they won't even have any desire to come back into the buildings. And, you know, I, I don't really, I don't buy that. And in fact, I've heard quite the opposite, and I've read quite the opposite in comments, and I've, I've heard specifically from people, and they've said, I miss seeing everyone. I miss the joy that comes from gathering together. But you know, if I had asked you three months ago, what do you really think about getting together? I wonder how many of us appreciate it more now than we would have three months ago, two months ago. Let's take this time to reflect and to comprehend the joy that ought to accompany the Christian life, that ought to accompany coming together and worshiping. We've had to, so to speak, dwell in tents for a month or two. Our lives have been disrupted and changed, and many of the things that we took for granted in our spiritual exercises, those things have been suspended. Just like the nation of Israel was in captivity and now they're back and, and all of these things that they'd missed, they get to do again. It ought to remind us as in Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. I can't wait until we can come together again. What will these conversations be like in the foyer? Well, what will the the discussions be like in the pews as we anticipate that first service back. I can't wait. And I'm, I'm filled with anticipation and joy at the thought of those opportunities. We need to underscore just how much joy we ought to have. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, the Thessalonians had written to Paul and one of the things that they had wondered about was what about these Christians who are already past? Will we see them again? How will the resurrection take place? Will they miss it? 
Do you have to be alive when Jesus returns in order to experience the joys of, of the resurrection and the life to come? And, and Paul gave them this instruction, and I'll tell you why it's important in just a minute. He said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Then here's the phrase that I want you to really pick up on. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He says, look, I understand that there are circumstances in life that cause the Christian sorrow, pain, discomfort. But we should not react to those things the same way as people who don't have Christ. Listen, the, the, the circumstances under which we're living right now aren't joyous for, for anybody. There, there are pains and, and uh, setbacks and troubles that occur for everybody in a circumstance like this. But Christians certainly ought to deal with it differently than others. We should have an avenue of hope. We should have a source of comfort that should be the envy of all of the world around us. I honestly can't wait until we can return to the life that we once had. And it's my hope that just as the nation of Israel did, that when we begin to reinstitute these parts of our lives that we once took for granted, that we'll have a greater appreciation for them. I wonder what that first Passover was like for these folks. I wonder what that first morning sacrifice was like. The first evening sacrifice, that first evening spent in a tabernacle commemorating the Feast of Booths. I wonder what the first one back was like. I wonder what the first service back will be like for us. I can't wait. As we consider what the nation of Israel did as they returned and as they begin to reinstitute and rebuild the foundation, notice these fundamental things. Again, underscored for them by these events was their complete and total dependence on God. You must, God said, focus on me because you need me every hour. Total respect for the power of God. His majesty demonstrated by His mercy on one hand and His judgment on the other. Our God is a consuming fire the love and the justice of God dwell equally within Him. And I hope we understand and we respect that. Dear friend, do you have the joy of salvation? The eunuch is often referenced concerning conversion, a complete demonstration of what a person needs to do to be saved, right? The Ethiopian eunuch is reading God's Word. Philip joins himself by instruction of God to the chariot the eunuch was in. He's reading from Isaiah 53 and, and Philip says, Do you understand what you read? The eunuch says, How can I accept some man God? I mean, this is all Acts chapter 8. And so he begins in Isaiah 53, Philip does, and he preaches to him Christ. And then they see water and the eunuch says, Here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? And, and Philip said, If you believe with all your heart you may. And and he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And, and immediately the chariot stood still and, and immediately Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And then it so aptly says that the eunuch went on his way rejoicing. He received something for which he was overjoyed. I've often wondered how long did he keep that joy? How long did that specific feeling stay with him? It's my hope that for him and that for all of us, we can reproduce that feeling every morning and every evening as we consider our God and our complete dependence on Him. Dear friends, if you are here within the sound of my voice this morning and you need that joy, We'd love to help you somehow, some way. 
We can get you in contact with someone who can help to teach you. We can show you the way of Christ as Philip did the eunuch. We can bury the old man of sin in a watery grave. And we can rejoice with you as you are saved from your sins. But maybe you are a Christian within the sound of my voice and and you've lost your joy. Maybe sin has robbed you of it. Maybe the worries and the cares of life have robbed you of your joy. I hope you understand this morning the joy that comes with living the Christian life and that you rejoice in the Lord always. We certainly hope that we can assist you. And we hope that you'll reach out to us if we can. Bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the wonderful opportunity that you give us to worship. Dear Father, we are so thankful for every opportunity, even if it's not exactly what we would desire because of the circumstances that surround us. But we pray, dear Lord, that you will help us to also look with anticipation on the opportunities that will be presented, if it is your will, to meet together again. We pray that you'll bless us so that we can see those times, if it is your will. And Father, may we even look farther into the future or whenever it may be to being with you and being able to worship you face to face. Father, we pray that you will forgive us if there's any wrong in our lives. Help us to obey you and to follow your will. Bless our nation. Bless our world. Bless the congregations that serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.